the next two speakers we got coming up, uh, I have something deeply in common with both of them. Uh, we all three have houses in Huntsville and none of us are ever in them. So running all over the world with all the, the things that they do. But we're fortunate this morning to have Major General Tom O'Connor, the commander of AMCOM down in Huntsville, uh, now the largest city in Alabama, and it's because AMCOM's gotten so big. No, I'm kidding. Um, Tom, thanks for being here, brother. We look forward to your comments. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Well, thank you uh, for the warm welcome, and uh, more importantly, thank you for what you do for our Army family. Uh, I would like to take uh, the opportunity to say that it's um, extremely honored and humbled to represent the over 12,000 AMCOM employees, Department of Army civilians, contractors, and service members that stand ready to enable the readiness of our aviation formations. I would also like to take the opportunity to highlight uh, something that General Crosby uh, alluded to this morning. Uh, you know, what we do is a dangerous business, and uh, we all have uh, suffered losses throughout our careers, uh, whether it be our service members, our allies, our partners. And I'd just like to take an opportunity uh, to, again, uh, reflect on the service and the loss of life of the soldiers in the, the 1st or 25th up in Fairbanks, Alaska. And pray for the surviving member uh, for a speedy recovery. I'd also like to take uh, and leverage uh, one of the tenets of Quad A and think about recognition. So first and foremost, uh, it's, it's extremely important for us to recognize uh, each other. And uh, I was extremely humbled uh, to be at the award ceremony last night and the recognition dinner uh, for the honorees to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And it's uh, no, no doubt in my mind that it motivates me every single day to be the best that I can be and for our organization to be the best that we can be because we do stand on the shoulders of giants. And we wouldn't be here today uh, as a branch uh, or as an army without those leaders that have come before us. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you again for uh, the character, competence, commitment, uh, what you've done to enable us to be successful, uh, to have the most lethal force uh, in the world. As we look at the, this photo here, uh, it's about people. We have a tremendous workforce uh, that again stands ready it's about trying to maintain these, this workforce, the capacity and capability it has to serve as a strategic reserve or a strategic capability or a strategic enabler uh, for our Army. As we think about it, we think about what does that mean, strategic readiness. There's many facets to strategic readiness, but one of, it, one of those facets is our industrial base's ability to surge and to meet the demand to enable our force uh, to be ready to fight and win on the battlefield tonight and in the future. We need to think through and look back on, reflect on what our organic industrial base and defense industrial base has done together as a team over the last decade or two decades uh, as we supported the global war on terror. We'll reflect back on the lessons learned from uh, World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. One of the things I'd like to highlight is this incredible workforce, what it's done, specifically in our organic industrial base at Corpus Christi. Since 2003, there has been 1,200, 1,200 aircraft that have been recapitalized or remanufactured at Corpus Christi. That's 1,200 aircraft that we were able to get back into the fight for less than 40% of the cost of what it would be to buy a new one to provide the capacity to get that aircraft back in a fight, to, to put weapon systems in the hand, hands of operators, truly enabled our operational commanders uh, to be successful on the battlefield. Industry and the defense industrial base was busy producing, but this is an alternate mechanism or means to produce and remanufacture or repair and return equipment to the battlefield uh, at a lower cost, but at a higher rate. And it's not lost on me that the over 500,000 components that were repaired during that same time period enabled readiness by getting repair parts returned back to the soldiers so they can maintain the operational readiness of our formations. Our organic industrial base serves as a strategic enabler uh, for our force. Our organic industrial base is full of proud artisans uh, that, are, that come to work every single day with the idea that they are impacting the fight. It's not the proximity to the fight, 
but it's what, what they do to support the fight that matters. That workforce has enabled our success over the last 20 years, and I'm super proud to be their commander. Move to the next slide, please. I would just like to highlight some of the conditions and some of the initiatives that we're uh, undertaking today in order to improve the readiness and set the conditions for the readiness uh, for our force today. As we look at our people, and our people is our most precious resource, uh, we've got initiatives to help train and hire new per personnel. One of the initiatives is called high velocity training. Uh, this year we're investing over $6 million in order to enable us to uh, apply some visualization tools uh, to be able to map routine tasks and to be able to onboard uh, people in a more efficient and effective manner uh, to understand what those tasks are, how to leverage the experience of 30, 40 years from other employees uh, that have been part of this incredible workforce and to off-ramp or to onboard more rapidly uh, those skills and skill sets uh, for our workforce uh, at Corpus Christi in particular. This is a, a Department of Defense initiative. It's endorsed by AMC. Uh, CCAD is one of the elements that's leading in uh, enabling the high velocity training to occur. It's about digitalizing and ensuring that we have visual aid tools uh, to, en to enable the workforce to be more proficient at their task. Retaining and recognizing our workforce. You know, one of the best things that we can do to retain our workforce is ensure we've got steady workflow. You know, as the commercial business uh, is hiring, as we're in a competition for resources, we're, we're in a competition to, to maintain the best and highest talented personnel that we can to ensure we provide the nation what it needs. Recognizing them and recognizing what they do and the difference they make is, is part of that but ensuring that they've got a steady job and they've got opportunities to excel, investing in their development, their growth, and in incorporating skills you know, in their formation, uh, in, in their development to enable them to move to the next level is extremely important. And we're investing a lot of time, money, and effort to ensure that we retain the best, we recognize them, and we provide them opportunities to continue to grow. We've got tremendous uh, community outreach programs that's, that's been established. We're working with local trade schools. Uh, we're working with uh, local colleges, uh, community colleges, uh, and, and colleges to ensure uh, that we're integrated into uh, their curriculum and that we're having an opportunity uh, to entice people to come work for uh, the, the workforce. We also are partnered with uh, the Soldier for Life program to ensure that soldiers that are transitioning have opportunities, whether it be at CCAD, whether it be as part of our contract force, or whether it be at uh, AMCOM in particular, uh, based on their skill sets and the requirements that are in there. But we have jobs, we have job openings, and we want to take the talent, we want to take those transitioning soldiers and then give them an opportunity to continue to serve and use the skills that they've learned over the years and apply it in a manner that still enables them to contribute to our nation's defense. Some of the products I want to highlight uh, that are being produced at, uh, at Corpus Christi in particular uh, one of which is our UH-60 Victor. Uh, to date, we've delivered uh, 43 that have been produced uh, at Corpus Christi, and the results are simply outstanding. This is where we're recapitalizing a UH-60 Lima, and we're integrating a new capability into that UH-60 Lima, and we're providing it back to the warfighter at uh, one-third the cost of what it be to procure a new one, and at a faster rate based on the production timelines uh, for the for uh, for the deliveries of UH-60 mics. It enables us to ensure that uh, we're, we're improving readiness, we're getting new capability into the warfighter's hand more rapidly. Uh, to date, we've, re we've received about a 96% OR rate of the aircraft that have been first delivered. Uh, these aircraft are, all, are right now in the hands of the 185th National Guard and are getting ready to uh, deploy to theater uh, this summer. The next fielding is scheduled uh, for later this summer will be to an active component uh, unit that's deployed, that's forward deployed in, in, in Europe. We're really proud of what we've done to, uh, to avoid costs, to improve readiness, and to inculcate new cap capability and technology uh, into our aging UH-60 Lima fleet. Components. Our component repair, you know, it, I, again, it's just incredible what, they, what the team is able to do to repair re components getting back to the warfighter to enable readiness at a lower cost. Uh, this year we've repaired over 6,000 components, everything from transmissions, engines, um, to hydraulic pumps, bearings, uh, electronics, avionics equipment, 
Uh, again, getting all that back to the warfighter as rapidly as possible to ensure that we uh, don't have challenges associated with the supply chain and supply chain uh, deliveries based off of the current marketplace. Aircraft repair. Unfortunately, we've had, uh, unfortunately we've had some challenges with uh, aircraft that are being damaged, uh, whether it be through uh, the battle, battle damage downrange and or the crash uh, due to accidents that have occurred uh, throughout the years. But we were able to take an aircraft and recapitalize that aircraft and return it back to, the, back to service. Uh, again, repairing something versus replacing something. Uh, this enables us to, to turn around an aircraft within a few years versus waiting till the end of the line and, and at a higher cost. Our aircraft, our aircraft repair return program costs about 40 to 48 percent, depending on the version of what it would cost to buy a new one, and we're getting that aircraft delivered back to the, to the warfighter uh, in uh, about a third of the time it would take uh, before the production line. As far as technology, so we're, we're nested in with uh, uh, the Army Futures Command, the CFT. We've partnered with academia and with industry to inculcate emerging technologies into our production facilities in order to leverage this capability and to improve uh, the capability that we have with our, with our workforce. Specifically, there's a few things that uh, we're seeing some great promise with. I'll just like to highlight one or two of them. One is with uh, cold spray. So cold spray, again, is uh, just pressurizing raw material uh, to, to a lower temperature and then blasting that material onto uh, areas of uh, where there has been some damage and or uh, some corrosion. This, this uh, at the molecular level, this enables uh, uh, the, the material to be solidified uh, and then cure in a manner that enables it to be tougher and more resilient than it was before. Instead of replacing components and removing components off of aircraft or vehicles, we're able to leverage cold spray to conduct repairs at a lower rate and get that uh, piece of equipment returned back to the field at a more rapid area. The other thing is our autonomous repair visualization inspection system that we've uh, partnered with uh, NIAIR and Wichita State, which has been an incredible opportunity for us to get robotics uh, into uh, the depot as one of the efforts to get robotics into the, into the depot uh, to be able to automate some of our tedious processes. Instead of tapping on a rotor blade, we've got a laser visual inspection, we've got laser abrasion, we've got the ability to uh, conduct limited repairs uh, in a mobile setting uh, for our, uh, our, our main rotor blades, uh, which again saves cost, time, and effort to repair, uh, prepare those, get those blades back into the supply system uh, and, and not necessarily uh, wait on delivery of new supplies. Those are all some of the efforts that we're doing today to ensure that we have the material readiness to support the warfighter that's in there. There's one more I would like to highlight, and that's the, in our supply chain. We recently realized uh, through COVID uh, that a single source of supply or raw material competition throughout the world you know, is significant. Uh, this caused, uh, and plus inflation, has caused some significant delays in delivery of material and supplies required to sustain the fight. As a result, we're exploring multiple options to reorganize and become more efficient uh, within our own supply chain network uh, to leverage AI, to leverage uh, uh, data analytics to drive better decisions. We've reorganized our supply department to ensure uh, that we've got a way to uh, optimize the supply chain. Everything from forecasting uh, to, to uh, demand requirements uh, and then also meat and supply deliveries that are in there. Part of that supply chain optimization is to ensure that we leverage the contract authority that we have to provide the strategic depth need needed to ensure we can sustain the fight. Now strategic depth, you know, is a challenge. You know, strategic depth is the mountains of material required to support the warfighter. Strategic depth means something different for each component. But strategic depth is where we need to get to to ensure we've got the agility and flexibility to meet a surging demand across the board. Supply chain optimization will ensure that we're leveraging the, author the contract authority we have to be more prudent and make better data-driven decisions to ensure we reach strategic depth at those components uh, that mean the most to us. What we're doing is set the conditions for the future. If you can go to the next slide, please. The future is coming. FVO is part of that future. Setting the conditions to sustain those weapon systems of the future starts today. If we look at the recent events in Ukraine and the demands on the supply system and the ability for the defense industrial base 
uh, in the organic industrial base uh, to meet the surging demands, it's, it's a little bit challenging. Um, the, the Army, the Department of Defense has recognized this and has prioritized the development and investment in our organic industrial base to ensure that we have the capacity and capability to maintain the weapon systems of the future. Part of this is a 15-year plan that is vested in all of our depots and arsenals. Uh, CCAD is one element of that plan, and CCAD is about a $1.7 billion investment uh, over the next uh, 10 to 15 years that will bring new capability uh, into Corpus Christi. Now, that capability is agile. That capability is designed to support not just the current systems, but also future systems. That capability is designed to leverage the requirements of today and tomorrow. One of those initiatives is, is in the cyber area. We know we've got to automate and digitize and leverage data and leverage the, the tooling that's required to use the data on a network that enables us to, to leverage the advanced manufacturing capabilities or requirements that are in there. To do that, we've got to protect it. So we need to have the cyber infrastructure that's established to ensure that we can protect the uh, intellectual property rights, uh, to ensure that counterfeit parts aren't manufactured, to ensure efficiency within the, within the supply chain, uh, and ensure that there's no uh, cyber intrusion along the way. It's one of the key efforts to ensure that we've got the network and the cyber facilities to protect you know, our automated processes of the future. Another thing is uh, in the environment, energy in the environment. Uh, the buildings that we're using aren't necessarily energy efficient today. We've got to find ways to be more resilient, uh, whether it be due to weather events, whether it be due to power outages, uh, to, uh, for, for in a congested logistics environment. We've got to have alternate sources of, of supply and alternate sources of energy to enable us uh, to continue to run our factories uh, at, and specifically at CCAD. Our tooling and our processes have to be agile enough where we're able to incorporate uh, new technology, new best practices developed by and innovated uh, through the defense industrial base into our repair and return uh, facilities, into our production facilities. So we're learning alongside uh, with our partners in industry to ensure that we've got the space that's agile enough to incorporate uh, the new tooling to, to manufacture those components that are necessary to maintain the systems of the future. Our facilities is, uh, is certainly you know, part of this big investment. Uh, we've got uh, multiple efforts along with uh, upgrading our facilities and creating uh, the systems and the processes within those facilities to enable us uh, to support the, the future. A few of them I'd just like to highlight. Uh, one is uh, an upgraded uh, hangar. A second is an, up, an, an upgraded or an engine's uh, powertrain facility that streamlines the process uh, for engines and, and powertrains to run through the building in one side and out the other side to ensure there's efficient manufacturing process along the way. And then finally, uh, a, a new build of our uh, aircraft manufacturing f facility uh, to ensure that we can meet the demands of the future force. And then finally, I'll end where I began, is about the workforce. We've got to ensure that we retain the best talent. We've got to ensure that we have uh, the people that are necessary to ensure they can support the warfighter uh, and the artisans that it takes to build and repair these components are critical skills that takes time to develop. We're investing in new capabilities or new, new efforts or new requirements along the board. We're, we're investing in developing a composite center of excellence to ensure that our workforce is able to leverage the, or repair the composite, uh, the composite aircraft of the future. We're investing in uh, microchips and investing in ways to repair our circuit cards and to ensure we can stay on top, uh, with, on top of the new, the new repair parts that are entering the supply system across the board. Once again, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be part of this broader family. I cannot thank the Defense Industrial Base uh, for leveraging the private-public partners to ensure that the Defense Industrial Base uh, is tight uh, between the organic industrial base. I can't uh, stand up here and, and thank enough Quad A for allowing us uh, this forum to come together uh, so we can network, uh, we can voice our concerns, we can voice you know, our strategic initiatives, and we have an opportunity to ensure that we say lockstep, move into the future, to build a network and to develop support for the initiatives across the way. Thank you for what you do for our soldiers. Thank you for what you do for our country. Thank you. Thank you. 
you know, these guys, they got a lot on their plates and, and to spend this much time with all of us shows, truly shows their commitment to the industrial partnership that we enjoy.